Okay, welcome everyone. I think we'll uh, start. There's still one or two people likely trickling in, but uh, it's great to have you back here again for our Distinguished Lecture Series. Again, before I get going, I want to thank the Global Institute for Water Security and, and Global Water Futures Project for underwriting this series. And today I have the, the real pleasure of welcoming Roy Brower uh, from the Department of Economics at University of Waterloo uh, to our, our campus. This is so, he, he's the executive director, as I'll mention in a moment, of an institute that's very similar to our Global Institute for Water Security. So we're hoping to forge some strong linkages between our two universities. Uh, Roy uh, comes by way of the Netherlands. He has an ag economics uh, degree from Wageningen, then did, took his PhD in environmental economics at the University of East Anglia in the UK. Uh, his main research interests are, not surprisingly, in water resource economics, in particular, water resource valuation, high economic modeling, and water uh, policy instruments. And as I said, since 2016, January 2016, he's been executive director of the uh, Water Institute at University of Waterloo. And at the time, I sat on the board of that institute, and I know just how excited the university was to, to pry him loose from, uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, Roy has quite uh, extensive experience. Before he came to Waterloo, he was... Uh, he was the head of department of environmental economics at the Free University in Amsterdam. He also worked five years outside of academia with the Dutch Water Ministry, where he was responsible for a lot of kind of economic planning in relation to water and river restoration. Uh, Roy is very active internationally. Uh, he's involved with EOAG, this uh, water institute in, in Zurich, uh, a very uh, a high, high power place on the international scene, and he's also part of the external advisory board of the uh, Vienna Technical University doctoral program. And if you remember, we had uh, Gunter Bloschel from that program here a couple of years ago telling us about that, uh, that amazing doctoral program. Uh, Roy's also editor-in-chief of the Elsevier Journal Water Resources and Economics, and really a thought leader in this area of water economics. So we're very happy to have him here tell us about integrated hydroeconomic modeling. Roy. Thank you very much. Jeff. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to be here, first time in, uh, in Saskatoon, I, I have to admit. Um, and um, I'm, I'm dropping in with my nose in the snow uh, last night. Um, I'm very happy. Um, about that too, to see the first snow of the year. I'm, I'm going to share with you in the next 40, 40 minutes or so some of the, um, the work that I did on, um, on hydroeconomic uh, modeling. A lot of that work uh, stems from, from some time ago, um, but it hopefully illustrates a little bit the way economics, uh, economists have been trying to link their work to, um, to water science, to, um, to, to inform uh, water policy. Um, and the setup of my, my presentation is, um, is, is as follows. I'll, I'll provide you a little bit with a, with a policy context. I, I, I think some of the um, 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 things that are going on in, in, in Europe have been very instrumental in, in driving a lot of the water resource economic work that I've been involved in. Um, I'll t talk a little bit about integrated water accounting and then from integrated water accounting, I'll, I'll go to integrated hydroeconomic modeling and then share with you some lessons learned and, and, and future research directions. Um, so the Water Framework Directive in, in, in Europe, it's been a massive uh, piece of legislation, new legislation uh, adopted in, in, in 2000. I think there was like a 10-year uh, trajectory preceding the adoption of the EU Water Framework Directive. It's a framework directive, which means that it incorporates and, and uh, encapsulates all the other directives uh, written by the European Commission related somehow to, to water, the nitrates directive, the, directive, the groundwater directive, the um, um, uh, bathing water directive, uh, and, and later on in 2006 also the floods directive. Um, it, it's, an, it's a very impressive piece of, um, of, of work um, because of its objectives, but also the means that it has identified to reach its objectives. Um, and the objective is, is formulated uh, here on the, uh, on the slide. The most important objective of the Water uh, Framework Directive is to, to reach good chemical and ecological status of all the water bodies, all service and groundwater bodies in European member states. And uh, 2015 was the first deadline by which 
the EU member states had to reach good uh, chemical and ecological status. They had to submit integrated river basin management plans to the European Commission, identify what measures they would undertake to ensure that by 2015 they would reach for the first time this uh, important objective. It was an, a directive that um, for the first time ever explicitly acknowledged the potential role that economics could play in reaching an ecological standard or a, an environmental standard. Uh, reaching good chemical and ecological status was to be achieved uh, on the basis of economic principles such as the polluter paste principle, economic analysis in the river basin characterization and the identification of cost-effective programs of measures um, and it identified very explicitly the role of economic instruments to ensure cost recovery of, um, of the different water services uh, provided by the water system but also by the different water actors. And what I will be focusing on in particular this uh, afternoon is the river basin characterization in Article 5 and then the cost-effective program of, of, of measures. The, cost, the river basin characterization was, was work that was conducted between 2000 and 2005, 2006 as, as a foundation of the river basin management plans to identify what exactly is wrong in the different river basins in, um, in, in these European member states and, and the cost-effective program of measures was the identification of the solution of uh, solving some of the uh, major uh, problems and challenges in, um, in, in, in these European member states. And I'll try to illustrate how that was, uh, what was addressed. Before I go there, I, I thought it might be a good idea to, to share with you the logic framework uh, that was developed under the European Water Framework Directive to give you a little bit of an idea of how economics played a role, but also how the decision-making procedure uh, looked like. Um, so it st started all with uh, the identification of the current status um, of, of groundwater bodies. And keep in mind that this was a, a, a piece of legislation that was put in place in 2000. In 2015 was the first time when these groundwater and surface water bodies had to be in a good state. Um, and so there was a time gap of 15 years between 2000 and 2015 to work towards these integrated river basin uh, management plans. So between 2000 and 2015, the current status of, of, of water bodies, in this case, for example, a groundwater body, could still change a lot because of social economic developments um, um, in, in a basin or in a watershed um, and the consequent pressures that these um, socioeconomic trends exert on the, on the water bodies. Um, and that was one very important first step. So the description of the river basin was in that sense not a static exercise. It was clearly dynamic in identifying what would happen to these water bodies now and into the future. The Water Framework Directive was to achieve its objectives for the first time in 2015, but then every other six, seven years, European member states have to submit an integrated river basin management plan to show progress on achieving those objectives. And I'll come back to that in a, in a, in a second. Um, so the first step was to, to characterize the, the, the river basin and to try to identify the status and to what extent there was an issue or there was a problem that had to be solved. And um, that was referred to as the gap analysis. So once you know what the current status is and what the expected status is going to be in 2015 and, and now again in 2021, um, and you, re you compare that with the required status of good chemical and ecological status and the oper operationalization of that through environmental threshold values, um, you basically identify whether or not you have a, have a problem. That's part of the gap analysis. You compare where you expect to be where with, where, with where you want to be. And if there is a discrepancy, you have a problem. And if you have a problem, the European Water Framework Directive um, forces you to uh, solve the problem. Um, and you do that through the identification of a cost-effective program of measures that ensures that you reach good chemical or ecological status um, in the future. So once you've identified the problem, uh, that is the gap between where you expect to be and where you want to be, you identify the possible measures. Um, and if you want to identify possible measures, you obviously need to know the underlying sources of the problem. And I'll show you or illustrate to you how we try to do that in one of the, um, in the different member states. Um, 
And then once you've identified the pol these policy me measures, you can still rank these policy measures. And here again, the Water Framework Directive was very instrumental in increasing the required expertise from economists because the program of measures had to be cost effective. And it sounds like a very logical uh, and a very rational thing to do, cost effective meaning least cost way possible. But working five years in the water ministry, I can guarantee you that um, that's not common practice. Um, in many cases, uh, there is overspending going, uh, going on, um, and it's not always the case that we, we implement our policies in the, in the least cost uh, way. So the, the, the European uh, Commission required the different member states to show, to demonstrate that this was indeed the least cost way of reaching the objectives. Um, so you select these cost-effective measures, and then, um, so not maybe surprisingly, in the same article where the European Commission is identifying and defining its objectives, um, like in many other pieces of environmental regulation and legislation, you had some other clauses in, 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 in included um, which provided some loopholes, so to say. So um, if the costs of the measures were considered in the same article um, as where the objectives were defined as disproportionate or it was technically not considered feasible of reaching these objectives, um, then you could either lower your environmental objectives or you could delay reaching these objectives in time. And that is basically what the last step uh, tr tries to illustrate. Um, there was this very important concept of disproportionate costs. There is not a single economist um, um, in the world, I would say, um, or argue that knows what exactly a disproportionate cost is. So there was a huge discussion in the European um, Union about what exactly are these disproportionate costs. And one of the assignments that I got um, right after I started um, uh, in, 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 in the early 2000s was to uh, define for the Dutch government um, that the costs of implementing these measures were going to be disproportionate. And it had a lot to do with the fact that we're the sink of Europe. Uh, a lot of the big transboundary rivers drain into the North Sea in, in, in the Netherlands. And um, no matter what we do, what happens around us in our surrounding uh, river basin countries uh, significantly affects the uh, quality levels of our um, water bodies. Um, so if you ask an economist to think about the concept of disproportionate costs, um, the most obvious tool economists have is cost-benefit analysis. So the Water Framework Directive isn't explicitly asking for a cost-benefit analysis. It asks for a cost-effectiveness analysis, which is not the same as a cost-benefit analysis. But this is how a lot of countries try to interpret um, and, and translate the idea of disproportionate costs. So think about how many times do the costs have to exceed the benefit in order for it to be qualified as disproportionate. Um, so in those kind of terms, I also try to investigate the uh, costs and benefits involved related with the uh, implementation of the Water Framework Directive. The issue and the problem obviously being um, um, that in this case you're dealing with an ecological directive where the economic benefits of ecological standards are, are very um, intangible are not always very clear. And it's basically representing um, the classical dilemma that we have in managing public goods and public resources that we know very well what the costs of managing them are, but we hardly have insight into the quantifiable benefits that are associated with it. So it poses some additional challenges to economists to help support decision-making in identifying when are measures considered disproportionate and when not. And different European member states use different rules or different criteria um, in interpret interpreting that, uh, that particular clause in the um, Water Framework Directive. So if you have grounds for considering um, costs to be too high or if you think that... Um, reaching the environmental objectives is, is technically not feasible. Take again my own country. Um, we have heavily modified body, water bodies in, 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 in approximately 90% of the cases. Everything has dike systems around it. There's hardly any natural water system anymore because we're so uh, fearful of uh, floods, etc. We've got polders, we drain our polders, we drain our lands, everything is, is artificial. Um, and it's an impossibility to simply remove those dikes. Public safety would be, um, um, would be involved. Um, and there's no way that an ecological directive would be so strong and so powerful for those dikes to be 
removed. So the Water Framework Directive op, op, um, uh, provides member states that are dealing with such uh, a situation where you have so many heavily modified water bodies um, to lower their environmental standards, standards. So if you then go back in the loop, you can reconsider setting the uh, threshold values. Um, then again, you check to what extent where you expect to be equals where you want to be, and you go through the same procedure again. And that is basically the logic framework of the, of the European Water Framework Directive. You identify whether you have a problem, and if you have a problem, you identify measures to solve the problem, and you have to solve the problem in the least cost way. That's basically what it says in a nutshell. And of course, there's a lot of other work surrounding all that, you, the, the setting of the threshold values, uh, the harmonization of these threshold values in international basins across different member states. Um, these threshold values are far from uh, harmonized across Euro European member states. So it took them also 15 years to sort this out, and some of the discussions are still ongoing um, when it comes to defining exactly what is a good chemical or a good ecological uh, state. So there are different European working groups uh, working on these issues. For some pollutants, they've solved the problem. For other pollutants, it's, it's work in progress and uh, learning by, uh, by, by doing. And if you don't have harmonized um, standards, uh, you can imagine that there will not be an agreement and consensus about the extent of the problem. And if you have no consensus about the extent of the problem, it's going to be an impossibility for you to identify what needs to be done in an inter international river basin context to solve the problem. And so it's really not trivial to start with the problem identification. You have to have consensus about that. Um, take flood control. Um, it's not directly related to water quality, of course, but uh, flood control, um, uh, uh, flood safety measures in Belgium and the Netherlands are orders of magnitude different. In Belgium, uh, a flood return period of once every 100 years is acceptable. It is absolutely not acceptable in the Netherlands. So if you have flood return periods, expected flood return periods as a result of climate change to exceed once every 100 years, uh, the Dutch will say, we have a problem in Belgium, there still is no problem. Um, and if you think you have to have international transboundary cooperation, um, you have to convince your neighbors to do something about a problem. If they don't recognize this to be a problem, you have a problem in itself. Yeah? Okay, some of the key characteristics, um, just for your information. So um, the relationship and the pressures exerted on the water bodies, in particular also by economic activities, became much more explicit in the river basin characterization. The river basin characterization was not just about hydro hydrology and ecology anymore. It was also about the economic values that were generated within these river basin countries. And if there is a problem and you know what the economic values or interests involved are, that also gives you some clue about the trade-offs involved between reaching an ecological status um, and, um, and, um, and the economic interests involved that would definitely be impaired or would be affected by reaching a good ecological status. There's a reason why certain water bodies are in a particular state. There is economic growth associated with it. And if you want to um, reverse the situation and if you want to improve the quality of these water bodies, that often has consequences, economic implications. And that is basically what a lot of the work that I did um, um, was all about. Uh, water transformations, meaning simply water extraction, uh, water use in all kinds of um, economic activities, very important ones, uh, producing beer, uh, food processing, paper, textile, uh, chemical industry, um, and then what happens with the, 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 the wastewater. The, 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 the wastewater is discharged again. Uh, to some extent, it's, it's, uh, it's purified, it's treated. In other cases, it is not. What made the Water Framework Directive different from what was already in place to a large extent when it comes to the chemical status was the ecology and the relationship between hydrology and, uh, and ecology, and also the impact of economic activities on ecology um, and, uh, and, and the economy. Um, and, and the concept that you use water as a source and, and a sink, and what is exactly the value of these water resources as, as, a, as a sink. And to what extent are these sink uh, functions being impaired by the discharge charge of excessive amounts of, um, of, of pollutants? 
Yeah, so, to, so seeing the economy as an integral part of your water system, of your ecosystem, was an important step uh, forwards. Um, the other uh, issue was that the um, European Commission asked for integrated river basin management plans, and these plans um, were not at the level of uh, provinces, of uh, municipalities, or of states. Uh, it, was a, um, uh, it was a state that was, or a government that was submitting the river basin management plan, but as the plan already says, it's a river basin management plan, and, and the boundaries of the plans were the basins. And if there is an international basin, it's the international uh, boundary of the basin that guided the river basin management plan plans. And we already have a long history of, um, um, of um, international basin organization, the Rhine Committee, the, the Skelt Committee, the Muse Committee, for example, the, the Elbe, and, and so on. Um, but the European um, Water Framework Directive, um, um, even more so than already in the past, force these different riparian uh, member states to, uh, to work together and produce uh, a, a joint report on the management of, this, um, of these shared river basins. And um, some of the things that I've been focusing on in my, in my work when you integrate hydro and economics is that if you go from individual water bodies to, um, to groups of water bodies, to a basin, even to an international basin, um, the complexity, of course, uh, um, increases um, uh, a lot, um, and also the underlying uh, un uncertainties. And how you deal at that um, is, is, uh, is, is, a very, uh, is a very important um, issue. Okay, so I go to the first um, uh, article that I wanted to discuss in the European Water Framework Directive, which was about the river basin characterization. This is the head of someone. Anyone has an idea who this is? Exactly. It's, uh, it's the Roman god Janus, um, and January is derived from Janus, and, and, and it's, it's the head that looks forward and, and backwards. And so one of the, the, the messages of my, my presentation is that if you want to predict the future impacts of water policy interventions, you need to understand how people currently or in the past engaged uh, or used the water resources. And if you want to build integrated hydroeconomic models, you need to have integrated hydroeconomic information systems to validate and, and um, uh, calibrate these, these models. And um, although the um, uh, European Water Framework Directive was asking for that integrated river basin characterization, there was not a single European member state prepared to, um, 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 to, to take off their bookshelves um, uh, these river basin characterizations, which said how economic activities related to, um, to the water resources in a basin. So those kind of integrated um, water information systems ha had to be developed for all the different river basins. And I'm, I'm presenting here to you um, one of the examples on which I work my, myself, um, where I try to link economic activities to both the extraction of water and the um, discharge of uh, wastewater back into the, um, into the water bodies. Um, I used all kinds of existing information systems. So in the Netherlands, we have a dense uh, network of, um, of monitoring, um, but these monitoring data relate to different activities, to different sources of pollution, uh, water extraction and uh, uh, emission, for example, and economic activity. So it's dispersed. The information is there, but it is dispersed and is fragmented across different institutions. So one of the important things I, I tried to do was to bring all these sources of information together in one integrated information system and to put them in, in one institution. And so the most important thing I maybe did in, in this respect was sign an agreement when I was in the water ministry with the director of statistics Netherlands to allow us access to their information sources and to stall or to implement that integrated information system um, in their institute. So the Statistics Netherlands, just like Statistics Canada, produces uh, national systems of accounts. It, it shows you the economic transactions in a particular year, but that information is uh, highly aggregated. It's presented and published at highly aggregated level in order to go deeper and to be able to identify, for example, where these economic transactions took place exactly, in which watershed or in which uh, river basin, requires that you actually go back to the original data sources and identify where that information comes from. And that's really not an easy task. No one gets access to that kind of data. 
um, in the Statistics Netherlands office, there are lots of computers. None of these computers have openings for nowadays USB, USBs. We had floppies in those days. Um, so nothing goes out physically out of that out of that uh, out of that uh, that building and and I had to hire someone for almost one full year and and um, 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 he did his um, internship so to say so to say in the uh, statistics uh, Netherlands office for one year to get access to that data um, and only at a higher aggregated level were we able to present the information that we got from them at river basin level and I will show you that uh, that, that, that in a second, but only after checking, double checking, triple checking by the statistical office to make sure that none of the confidentiality issues were, were uh, breached uh, by presenting economic information at a lower aggregated level. And so it became, that it, so that it ensured that it was impossible to link economic information to individual industries. These industries would never ever cooperate anymore with the statistical office if they found out that their information was made publicly available. That's not the, um, that's not the idea. Um, and similarly uh, for the um, RIVM is the environment agency in the, in the Netherlands. Um, similarly for the emission registration, all that, also that information is not always directly publicly available. This is the, the, the accounting system that I, that I worked on. Um, and it's basically a, a set of satellite accounts. So in economics, we measure our economic uh, growth, our economic progress by, by indicators like GDP, gross domestic product. Uh, it's a very important indicator for a lot of policymakers because um, whether or not they get reelected depends on how well the economy is doing. And the red part in this uh, slide shows you um, the concept of the system of national accounts. It's much bigger than that. Um, big book works have been written about how to harmonize these systems of national accounts across countries. So since the 1960s, especially the UN Statistical Office has been very instrumental in driving this process to make sure that when we ha um, have GDP numbers across countries that they are directly comparable. Statistical offices work by the book. They hate to change things in their system of national accounts. They stay by what is uh, um, um, prescribed in their books. So there is no way that I'm able to uh, mess around with the core system of national accounts. They would never allow me to do it. And that's why I developed this set of blue accounts, satellite accounts around the system of national accounts. And so let me try to walk you through the, the system of, um, of national accounts. So I just included the, um, the, the three main categories uh, of sectors um, in, in, the, um, in the system of national accounts. So you have agriculture, industry, and, and households, uh, and the rows show you the production levels, and the columns show you the consumption levels. Yeah, so economics is about supply and demand. It's about consumption and production. In, in, in very simple terms. So agriculture, if you go to the first row, um, uh, produces X1, X2, X3. Gross output is X1 plus X2 plus X3, um, and it produces for itself. There is some self-consumption, X1. Um, it delivers uh, uh, products to industry, which is X2, and, and it sells food products to households, which is uh, uh, X3. Um, it consumes things, so the column, the first red column under agriculture is X1, um, and industry also provides goods and services to industry, machinery, for example, a tractor um, that, in, that agriculture buys from, 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 from other companies. Um, so, and then what is very important is that uh, gro gross output minus what we consume uh, gives us the value added, and the sum of value added across all these different sectors gives us GDP. GDP is simply the sum of the value added by the even different economic sectors. Yeah, so X1 plus X2 plus X3 minus X1 minus X4 gives us X2 plus X3 uh, minus X4, and that's the value added in, um, in, in, in agriculture. You do that for industry, um, and um, um, then you get GDP households, by definition, don't produce value added. There's a labor market. They produce labor or they have labor. They supply labor in these different sectors. Um, but this is, in, in principle, how we measure progress and how we measure economic growth in an economic system. Yeah? So typically, the way we talk about this is that in economic systems or in our economy, we produce goods. Um, environmental economists like myself um, then argue, but we also produce bats, not only goods. 
and, and some of the bads are, for example, the pollut pollution that we cause through our economic production processes. So we discharge, for example, um, uh, wastewater that we use. So we um, extract water. So the consumption is, again, in the column. Take agriculture, Y4 is the amount of water that agriculture pumps up for irrigating its crops. Um, agriculture or industry also discharge water, um, sometimes wastewater, and that's measured as Y1, Y2, households discharge through the utilities, uh, an amount of uh, wastewater. So that's the quantity, the discharge. The extraction is the quantity of uh, water that is extracted and consumed by the different um, uh, um, um, uh, sectors, and then the difference gives you the water balance. Yeah, so what comes in has to go out, um, and the residual is, gives you the balance. It's simply the water balance of a country. Yeah, so we have data and information about how much water industry, for example, and agriculture is using every year to produce their goods. And all I did was to link the uh, production processes to the amount of, amounts of water that they use and the amounts of water that they discharge. And there is data about that available. Um, that data was available uh, at different spatial scales. It was available for different sectors. And it took me a long time, together with the person working in the statistical office, to harmonize that, to be able to identify which sectors correspond with which sectors in the system of national accounts. So the system of national accounts is my reference point. The way industries are broken down in subcategories, branches, etc., cetera, is, is driving the way we then decompose the use and discharge of water. And then obviously that, that water that is being discharged uh, includes pollutants. Um, and so we are able to derive the kilograms of pollutants that are associated with the discharge of that, that wastewater. Um, and some part of the pollution is absorbed. Um, so the emissions are, are in the last column, uh, Z1, Z2, Z3. Um, and there is some self-absorption taking place by agriculture, by industry, by the public utilities. Um, and again, the difference between what is discharged and what is um, um, or sorry, what is emitted and what is absorbed gives us the residue and that's the deposition in the water system. Yeah? So that is basically how, how, how these sets of satellite accounts uh, work. This is the framework. Um, and then we go from this framework to the available data uh, and data sources. This is an overview of um, the tiny country where I come from, the Netherlands, and the different colors re represent different uh, river basins. Um, I don't know how many times this country fits into your province, um, but I imagine several times. Um, so the scale of operation is, um, is much um, uh, uh, smaller, um, but the problems nevertheless n not, not less than what you have here. Um, and as I mentioned, we're really literally the sink of Europe. A lot of pollution comes or enters the country through the Rhine and the Meuse and the Skelt from our neighboring uh, countries. Um, so this is to illustrate um, uh, a little bit also the time frame. It took me years to develop this uh, information system. The idea, the concept was, um, was, was done in no time, getting permission to access all that data, uh, to put all that data together and to, 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 to give it a home in the statistical office. That, that, was, a, that was a process of a number of years. Um, in the first few years, we focused on the pollutants that, you, that have that blue bar in front of it. So we started with, uh, with arsenic, cadmium, uh, uh, mercury, lead, uh, nickel um, and the um, uh, zinc and the, um, uh, the nutrients, for example. And then later on, we, uh, we extended the list to the 78 substances that were at that time considered the priority substances, the priority pollutants by the European Water Framework Directive. Yeah, so little steps and then in the end, uh, initially also only at the national level. Um, because I, ha I had to find ways also of disaggregating the national level information to the different uh, uh, river basins, and we used GIS uh, for, for that to allocate the um, economic activities and the water uses and the emission levels um, to the different uh, uh, basins 
and, and again, also that was not very um, uh, easy. Some arbitrary choices there had to be made as well. Um, but in the end, we managed to set this uh, information system up. I, I'm, I'm presenting you here uh, a little bit of old data, but it's an institutionalized information system that is being used to inform the European Commission nowadays about the river basin characterization under the European Water Framework uh, Directive. We have, uh, as additional information, uh, the water, uh, wastewater measured in inhabitant equivalents. Um, and what I can show you here um, in the next slides is how that information, how we can present that kind of information, and what the usefulness of that uh, information um, is. So, first of all, um, it gives us the opportunity to um, allocate uh, our GDP to, to the different river basins. So we know where the highest economic values are being generated um, in, in, um, in, in the different basins that make up uh, the, the, the Netherlands. So 371 billion in total, most of it, 50 percent, is in, 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 in the Rhine West. Rhine West is basically the area w around Rotterdam, Amsterdam, Schiphol Airport, and so on. It's the western part of the country where most of the economic um, uh, values are being uh, um, uh, generated. Yeah, so it's one thing to identify where most of these activities take place. It's a second thing, by the way, to link those um, 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 uh, activities directly to the different water uses and um, uh, uh, discharges. Um, but this just gives you an idea of what gr um, um, overall the shares of economic values are across these different, different river basins. So if you think that you really have a big problem in Rhine West, you also know that the economic interests involved are going to be huge. Um, and so you're going to affect a lot of the uh, economic values that are generated in that particular uh, area. And that's basically what we face in, in making these water management decisions. If we want to improve water quality that are waters, from waters that are impaired by economic activities, uh, something has to give. There is a trade-off. Um, and, and sometimes they can go a little bit hand in hand, but of, often, typically, you see you grow, but then at the expense of something else, unless you have uh, efficiency innovation in technology, for example, and you can save on some water. But typically, if you grow, that goes at the expense of the resources that you have available. So from economic values to um, uh, millions of cubic meters uh, of, of water use, also across the different uh, river basins, again, making a distinction between groundwater, uh, uh, fresh and salt service water, and tap water. Um, and I think I made a comparison with what you have here in Canada. So it's, uh, um, it's, it's approximately half of what you um, consume here in in, in Canada in the year 2013, um, we're able to present um, water use um, um, also by sector um, across the, the, the different river basins. And I'm showing you here as an example the, the, the largest river basin, Rhine West. Um, so how much water is used in total, uh, what different types of water are being used, um, and, and who exactly are the water users. So this is water quantity. This is the wastewater discharge. Um, so they take water in, they discharge it again, again um, uh, measured across the different uh, basins. So you can see that Rhine West, where most of the economic value is generated, also has the largest share in wastewater discharge. Um, and then we can decompose that wastewater. We can identify what kind of pollutants are in that water. Um, this is uh, emission of metals, for example, arsenic, cadmium, chromium, copper, mercury, lead, and nickel. Um, again, across the different um, uh, basins, um, the, the nutrients, N and P, across the different uh, basins, um, especially the, the, the green one, which is the muse, which is more of a rural agricultural area. There's a lot of, um, of, of nutrients coming out of that, but also, as you see again, from Rhine West. Um, and then not only per uh, river basin, but then also which sector in that river basin is responsible for the largest share of, uh, of, of pollution. And this is crucial, vital information if you want to say anything at all about the cost effectiveness of your program of measures. If you want to identify the, the problems, this is where it starts, in my view. You look at the loads, the pressures that uh, are exerted on the water bodies, to what extent they exceed 
the uh, standards that you have uh, imposed and you have to have an idea um, where exactly and by whom exactly those pollutants are, are discharged. You need to know what the sources of pollution are in order to be able to identify cost-effective measures. You cannot solve an issue if you don't know who causes the issue. Yeah, so this is emissions per sector for different um, uh, pollutants. Um, and, and I like this one uh, uh, best, especially the top one, which is for the whole country. Uh, but we're also able to show these uh, coupled indicators for the different river basins. Um, so what you see here is the growth of GDP, which is in the top um, diagram, the green line, and, and we grow. We have a number of percentages per year that we grow. This was before the financial crisis. Um, but typically, this is what you see. And why do I like this, this diagram so much? Can anyone share that, share that with me? Do you have an idea? So you have nutrients, metals, and wastewater being the yellow, purple, and blue line. Well, why is this, a, this is, is this a nice picture? Why does that picture make me happy? Why would that picture make you happy if you would be able to show such a picture for Canada or for Saskatchewan? Exactly. Yeah, so it's a nice example of decoupling. We grow, but we somehow manage to increase the efficiency by which we use our resources. Um, and that's what we like to see. And ideally, governments also monitor their investments in water management. Um, and we do lots and lots of monitoring in, 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 in European member states, um, in, in the country where I come from as well. But, but um, unfortunately, um, that monitoring is very generic. It, they just, every two weeks, they put a, um, 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 they, they take a sample from a water body and they, they put it in their, their, their monitoring system. There is hardly any monitoring going on directly related to policy interventions. And that is what you would need, uh, ideally, I think, um, in, in a cost effectiveness analysis. So if there is policy that was initiated, in this case, in 1996, um, it, it's been very successful because economic growth was not impaired, but, but, but the, the pollution levels went down. So you introduced something in 1996, it seemed to have been very successful. But ideally, you, what you also are able to identify what exactly, what was it that you did to ensure that this picture emerged. Yeah, so there's a, a, a slightly similar uh, picture arising from the Rhine. The Muse is more erratic, growth is there, but uh, in particular, metals goes a little bit up and down, um, and uh, it's mainly um, the, 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 oh, it's the nutrients that, that, that go, go down. But these are the kinds of integrated sets of indicators or sets of integrated indicators that you're able to present policymakers with. And, and it's, it's more than just GDP. You can do the same thing for other environmental uh, issues and a lot of uh, countries do this. It's called green accounting, um, but this was the first water accounting system, integrated water accounting system in Europe. Um, so no one had actually put this information together just for for um, for, for water, and it's been very useful. Um, once it's there, you just have to update it. Once the methodology has been figured out, um, then you can just present that uh, on an annual basis. And as I mentioned, it's now used every year to. Um, to, to uh, inform these uh, integrated river basin management plans. So some of the cha challenges, uh, different statistics from different data sources. So uh, it was a real struggle to make the um, in, uh, information and uh, the data that was available about emission, uh, water use, extraction, uh, economic activities uh, compatible. Different classifications were used, for example, for economic activities. And the system of national accounts, again, as I said, was the benchmark. That was the reference point. So everything that I had um, from the emission uh, registration was um, registered according to a certain methodology of identifying pollution sources. And then I still had to somehow think, okay, where exactly does that pollution source fit in um, when it comes to the, uh, the economic activity uh, involved? And that was not always uh, a very straightforward um, exercise. Uh, different scales at which these uh, data are monitored, um, um, and, and they don't necessarily always uh, correspond with the management scales. Uh, different sampling, aggregation pr procedures. I already mentioned the confidentiality issues um, and very important to also um, 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 point out is that um, 
ideally we, we, we work with observations, but even in emission registrations, they had models to simulate uh, and calculate or estimate, approximate some of the emission levels. So not everything was uh, always uh, based on actual observations. Um, and this is an example of um, how matching skills can, can differ between economics and uh, hydrological and, uh, and, and, and chemical data. Um, so we had the hydrological and chemical data at national level, uh, just like the economic data, but then you can see things start to, to, to deviate. Um, we have some accounts at provincial level, then CORUP and EGS, um, uh, Economic Geographical uh, Strata, it's, it, it refers to municipalities and postal codes. Um, they, 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 they don't correspond anymore with the hydrological um, 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 boundaries um, uh, at which or within which we, we measure water management activities. So we have water boards in, in, in Holland, regional water boards. There were 56 in the early 2000s. Uh, they have already been reduced to, uh, to less than that. Um, then we have so-called districts. There were 80 of them, and then we got these water discharge units, more than 1,000 of these units. Um, and these water discharge units are found across different municipalities. So uh, through GIS, we had to make those different spatial skills compatible to be able to present that at the level of these different sub-basins. So that's, that's an example of, of, of some of the accounting uh, work that went on. And, and basically, um, if you want to do macroeconomic modeling, meaning that you want to say something about the economic effects of uh, national water policy, you need to um, have data at that level um, to be able to assess the economic impacts of uh, reducing emission levels, for example. Um, and I'll show you some, um, some examples in the, in the next part of the um, of the, of, the, of the presentation. So we go from looking backwards, we go to looking forwards now, um, and um, I'm going to present to you uh, two different types of uh, hydroeconomic models. So this is a, is a, is a very simple um, diagram that I, that I made some years ago um, about how we could categorize or how we can categorize the different types of uh, hydroeconomic models. From the 1960s, uh, from the US in, in, in particular, um, we have a lot of um, uh, models, agronomic models, where um, engineers, in, in particular agronomists, added an economic module on the um, optimization of water allocation across different plots of land with different types of crops. Um, and they used prices of the crops as, a, as an additional control variable to identify and define, determine um, what the optimal level of water allocation is across these plots and across these different crops. Uh, uh, um, in, a, in a particular uh, year or season. Um, and these are typically uh, bottom-up hyd hydrological models. So they're very detailed. They're bottom-up because they're, they're at the level of a plot, for example. They're very detailed in, 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 in the hydrology, the land and water um, uh, use interaction. Um, they hardly include a, a lot of of, of, uh, of economics, a very simple add-on, like a price, as simple as a price, simply the yield multiplied by the price. So the yield in kilograms multiplied by the, um, uh, the dollars per kilogram that you get out of a yield of a particular uh, plot. Um, and I'm going to show you an example from, from such a bottom-up approach. It's related to the groundwater directive. Um, and then later on, I'll, I'll go back a little bit to the uh, water framework directive where I show you a more top-down approach where we have an economic model where the level of e uh, detail on the economic side is, is, ve is, is, is very high um, and the level of, um, of, of, of water is, uh, is very limited. In, in fact, um, the only thing that flows in these economic models is, model, is, is money and not water. Um, and I'll show you an example of, of, of that later on. This is an, uh, an example from, um, from a, an interdis or, or a, or a transboundary uh, project in which I was involved looking at the um, um, uh, implementation of the groundwater directive. Nitrates, a big issue in, in, in European member states. This is a case study from the Netherlands uh, again. Um, I hope in the future to be able to populate this presentation with, with more examples from Canada. Um, agriculture being uh, responsible for 70% of the pollution, atmospheric deposition 30%, uh, 50 milligrams uh, of nitrates per liter is the, is the, is the standard. Um, everything that is uh, orange and red in this picture is, is bad and has to be sold. 
and there is a lot of red, as you can as you can see. Um, so, um, what the EU Water Framework Directive, uh, which includes the Groundwater Directive, then uh, asks for is uh, solve this problem, but do it in the least cost cost way. Um, and and some of the work that I have done in this uh, particular area um, relates to the use of different environmental indicators. Um, so it's one thing to do a cost-effectiveness analysis on the load reduction, on the pressure reduction. Uh, it's another thing to do it on the impact. Um, and what I'm trying to illustrate here to you is uh, what difference it makes. So economists are typically um, used to do these kind of exercises uh, on their own without, uh, without a hydrologist or a, or a water quality uh, specialist and all they look at is um, how can we reduce the kilograms of nitrogen, for example, spread uh, uh, as manure on a, on a piece of land, on a hectare of, of, of land. And um, some of the work that I've been doing is that is showing that, especially in, in situations where you have upstream downstream um, uh, uh, relationships and, uh, and, and um, uh, effects, uh, of what you do upstream, downstream, um, is that the use of um, impact indicators really changes the results of your cost-effectiveness analysis. So um, what I'm arguing for is that we, we as economists really have to collaborate with water quality modelers to be able to assess what exactly the impact of these measures are on water quality. And good chemical or ecological status refers to the water quality. It refers to the impact of these measures on water quality. It's not enough to just look at the pressure reduction. So um, it's the least cost way to reach environmental objectives. As I already mentioned, it's a very simple uh, analysis. It's a very nice example of how uh, different disciplines can, can work together because I calculate the cost and some, some, someone else, another expert, an environmental scientist, for example, uh, tells me what the impacts are in terms of kilogram of nitrogen reduction, for example, or the impact on water quality with the help of a water quality uh, model, and you simply uh, divide the costs of a measure by the uh, emission reduction or the impact on uh, reducing the concentration level of a particular pollutant. And that's all that it is. It's the unit cost of reducing one kilogram of P or N on a piece of land uh, or reducing um, one um, 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 milligram of nitrate per liter of, uh, of, of water. That is what a cost effectiveness analysis basically tells you. What are the investment costs um, per unit? Um, pressure reduction or are uh, on impact. So typically what, what, what we work with is land use change models um, and we reduce the, the pressure. If we want to be able to say something about the impact of the pressure reduction on the water quality, we need water quality models. Um, and um, in this particular case, I looked at the uh, connection between groundwater and service water. Actually, I didn't do it, but I worked together with someone who had that model um, and enabled me to look both at the pressure reduction and the impact on groundwater quality. This is a schematic uh, overview of that, uh, of that uh, model. It was developed by a person in the Environment Agency in, in, in the Netherlands. It's uh, relating uh, runoff of chemicals on land into ditches and, uh, and uh, how it enters the, um, the, 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 the shallow groundwaters uh, in that particular area. It was a national, or it is a national model that I, uh, that I used, but it was calibrated, as I will uh, show you here in the next slide, for that particular area. It's densely monitored, um, all the different dots, the red and the green ones are different uh, uh, federal and provincial monitoring networks, um, and we use that data to calibrate the relationships between pressures on the land and the impacts that it had on, on groundwater and con on service water and connected groundwaters uh, using that monitoring data. And I, I work with that expert in the Environment Agency, and I, I, I had a research uh, assistant from um, the Department of Hydrology uh, at the Freie Universiteit in Amsterdam, where I was uh, working at that time, to, uh, to, to calibrate that model. So, um, first of all, and it was a spatially explicit uh, uh, model, and um, I also wanted to show policymakers not only um, um, what type of measures were most cost effective, but I also wanted to show them um, where their, their dollar or their euro uh, would generate the highest value. So it all starts with, with, uh, with um, creating a baseline scenario. This was a study that was conducted in 2005, I believe, 
Um, so we still had 10 years to go before 2015. Um, and so we looked at uh, trends in pressures, et cetera, from agriculture, industry, uh, households, et cetera, um, in that particular region on the groundwater bodies. Um, we had information about the current loads, um, and the loads were translated into concentration levels, and those were compared with the monitoring data from the monitoring stations that I just showed you. A lot of orange uh, on the right-hand side, so the, 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 the most uh, left-hand side picture with the pink um, is the load. That's the kilograms of um, uh, N uh, per hectare. And then the middle one is, um, I have to look carefully, that's the um, uh, shallow groundwater. So the water quality levels, that's the nitrate levels per liter uh, for the shallow groundwater. And then uh, the right hand side uh, diagram is the um, water quality level of the, of the service water. Yeah, so I, I had um, information about both ground, shallow groundwater and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and service water. And again, just like in the, in the, in the first picture that I showed you um, about the situation, agriculture 70%, atmospheric deposition 30%, red and orange is bad, green is good. We want everything to be good. That is considered good ecological uh, status. So everything above 50 milligrams um, uh, per, per liter is, um, is, is, is not good. Um, so we had the baseline scenario and then together with um, stakeholders in the region, and there is a regional water board uh, responsible for water management in this area, we identified all kinds of different uh, uh, policy uh, measures that we could uh, take. So we identify policy scenarios. And I'm just going to show you here two. Um, one where we extensified the uh, livestock. So we reduced the number of cows in this particular case per hectare of land. Um, and then the, the light blue shows you what the reduction in kilogram of N per hectare is, the resulting reduction in kilogram of N per hectare. The, the middle one shows you the impact on groundwater, shallow groundwater, um, and that's really getting nice, nicely green. The, the, the right-hand side one is still very um, um, orange and a little bit red, and that's still not completely, um, completely good but it has a little bit of an impact. This is another policy scenario that we calculated through um, with, that, with that model. Uh, nature development, basically it means set aside. So parts of the agricultural land are being set aside for nature development. So uh, groundwater levels were allowed to, uh, to, to, to rise again. Uh, no farming activities would, uh, would t take uh, place. Um, and so the nutrient uh, load reduction um, the, the, the blue one on the left-hand side is, is, is it's bluer because there is more uh, uh, nitrogen reduction. Uh, so you reduce the load, the, 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 the groundwater becomes even greener. Um, unfortunately, the shallow um, uh, service waters or the service waters remain um, orange and, uh, and, and red. So I have these policy measures. I, I was the economist on, on that uh, project. I, I calculated the costs of these, uh, of these measures. I divided it by the reduction in loads and by the uh, reduction in um, uh, milligrams per liter of, uh, of water. And, uh, and doing that allowed me to, um, to identify what the least cost option or scenario is to reach uh, good chemical or ecological status, chemical status in this stage, because we're talking just about the, 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 the nitrogen. And the lower the bar, and you can hardly see it, but there's a little uh, black bar for optimization of fertilizer application. So optimizing the use, the current use of fertilizer was the least cost way, um, the least cost uh, measure um, to reduce the, 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 the impacts on water quality. Uh, followed by after crops, which is you have a crop and then afterwards you have another crop and that absorbs more of the nutrients that remain in the soil, uh, manure-free free, uh, buffer zones, livestock extension, and the most expensive one is, is nature uh, development. So these are thousands of euros per milligrams of uh, nitrate uh, per, per liter. Yeah, so uh, setting land aside, you lose most income. And so that's the most costly option. Um, and you can reduce the, 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 the nitrogen, the nitrate, uh, um, much cheaper by optimizing the fertilizers. And as I mentioned, and as you could perhaps also see based on the, on the, on the maps that I showed you, I was also able to um, uh, advise the, 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 policy maker, the regional policymakers about where exactly they should start. So it looked a little bit like islands. There are actually little islands, um, and these islands have different names. So there's a dune system, there's a creek north, creek central, creek south, sand 
uh, sandy soils and there's clay peat soils. Clay peat soils were the, the most productive one, were the most costly to take out of production. Uh, creeks north is, is where they should start uh, reducing the, um, uh, the, the, the nitrogen load uh, according to this uh, analysis. So besides identifying which measures, we were also able to tell them where they should do it. Uh, this was more of an island system, so uh, upstream-downstream relationship didn't really work, um, but you can imagine that this is very useful information as well if you're able in your water quality model to account for the fact that upstream activities also reduce pressures downstream. So um, cost-effective policy measures, if you want to do this properly and link it to the objectives, you need to be able to make the link between pressure reduction and the impact on water quality. This means that you have to collaborate with uh, water quality modelers, um, which affects you use as indicator determines very much which measures you um, uh, select um, and prioritize. Um, and you could see that there was a wide spatial variety um, on how to implement your, uh, your measures. I also did an uncertainty analysis, but I, I think I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll skip that. Um, including uncertainty also changed the ranking of the, um, of the measures. There's a reference there if you're interested in that. I'll quickly go through some of the last slides. Um, the top-down approach, an economic model um, focusing on the implementation of the water framework directive for the country as a whole. Um, so these are the different economic scales that we worked at where we um, upgraded or upscaled the firm model to a sector model, regional model, and then a national model. Um, and, and I introduced a different approach to integrated modeling in a, in a special issue in ecological economics in 2008 um, where, where we introduced this modular approach. It's directly based on the integrated information system that I talked about uh, before. Um, and so this was one of the first attempts that we did. So eight years after the adoption of the Water Framework Directive, once we had this information system in place, we were also uh, able to modify our economic models, um, link it to a water and substance flow models, and uh, estimate what the direct and indirect economic impacts are of uh, implementation of the Water Framework Directive. And then um, that was a static an analysis, simply comparing where we are now with where we want to be. But then we also extended that particular model um, with a water quality model. Um, and we did an iterative uh, dynamic approach where we um, um, uh, iteratively looked at how much um, we had to reduce the economic activities uh, in order to reach the uh, environmental objectives uh, related to the water quality standards. And that allowed us to assess, as you can see in this uh, slide, um, um, the costs over, over time uh, for different uh, emission reduction scenarios. So 20%, uh, 50%, and 50% uh, reduction, including what, we, what was referred to as derogation, meaning that you can delay reaching the environmental objectives in, in time. So we, we are again able on the basis of these integrated models to present policymakers with two different types of information. At the bottom, you see the baseline situation in 2015 for zinc. Um, and we had uh, all these prior, we did this for all the different priority substances. This is an example for zinc. The situation in 2000 for the major uh, water bodies in the Netherlands was, uh, was, was, was um, uh, orange, which is bad. We want everything to be green or blue. Um, and so, we can go from the situation um, of, of, of orange to blue or green, but it comes at a cost, and that is the reduction in GDP. So you can see on the top uh, half, um, we were able to show the policymakers what the economic implications are of ensuring or transforming your border bodies from an orange state to a green-blue state. And, and it's in, in small percentages from... Um, 0.05% uh, to 0.3 and 0.5%. Uh, and these seem like very uh, small percentages. But keep in mind, I, I showed you the GDP, the total GDP in the beginning, which was 370 billion uh, uh, euros per year. So uh, a small fraction of that are, is millions of, of, of euros to achieve a good chemical status for this particular uh, pollutant. And, and, and it is my belief um, that this kind of information to policymakers, this set of indicators, um, also making it dynamic over time and uh, how, how the co costs would evolve over time, 
um, based on implementing uh, a piece of legislation like the Water Framework Directive, uh, how that affects GDP is, is very informative. This is the kind of information that they want to know. They want to know it at the level of the individual river basin, but also for the entire economy. And if you're talking about big, major pieces of uh, legislation like the European Water Framework Directive, it's not just going to be agriculture that's going to be affected. Um, in economics, you also have economic systems, just like you have hydrological systems. Economic sectors do not operate in isolation. Having an economic model that um, includes all the different sectors and how they interact and how they trade amongst each other is, is paramount to identify how reducing value added in one sector is also going to impact value added in related sectors. Transportation, for example. Um, and primary agricultural production is, is highly dependent on the agri-food business, um, and that generates uh, value added as well. So you impact the primary production, you also impact other sectors. And these kind of models are not uh, suitable for minor interventions, but the Water Framework Directive is really asking a lot of the member states uh, to change in the way they engage with their water that we thought that this kind of modeling approach was, um, was, was justified. I'm, I'm, I'm really there now. Integrated models need integrated data. We were only able to do this because we had this integrated database. Uh, calibrating the models based on that, um, on that set of satellite uh, accounts uh, was the first essential steps to be able to do this, uh, to do this kind of work. Um, data is available but not in ready-to-use format, um, and things had to be connected. Uh, simplifications are inevitable. Uh, Trade-offs are, are, are needed. What is very important is to ask the question, at what level is, um, is, are the results still meaningful to, to policymakers? Um, I, I, I hinted a little bit at this um, in my presentation. Um, there's a lot of monitoring going on, not only in the Netherlands, in lots of European member states. Uh, there are lots of uh, data storage houses. Uh, a lot of that data is just, is just there. It, it, it's just stored there. It's monitoring for the sake of monitoring. There is no direct link often to the water policy intervention or the measures that are being taken and uh, monitoring of how water quality changes uh, with uh, changes in, in water management. And, and I think that's really a, a, a caveat. Also, setting up these monitoring systems in places where this is still not the case requires a vision of what do you really want to do with that data. Uh, how do you manage your data? How do you want to use your data? How do you want to use it in integrated information system? If you think this is the way forward, uh, you have to have a vision on how you collect and how you store and manage your, um, your, your different data sources. Um, I talked about the impacts on agriculture, on, on other sectors which um, um, uh, produce and trade goods on markets which have market prices. W what I didn't talk about and what, keeps, uh, what remains outside of this um, of this modeling exercise is what is the value that we attach to a good ecological status? What are the ecosystem services that are provided by good ecological status? Those values remain invisible uh, and uh, are remain outside of the uh, traditional accounting systems um, because natural capital and the ecosystem services that they provide are often free of charge. They don't have a market price. So they are not included in the system of national accounts. And a lot of efforts are also ongoing um, in Europe, in Canada, and elsewhere to also factor those things in. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, we're a bit over time, but uh, maybe one or two quick questions just before we break and maybe go to Boffins where we can have a longer discussion. Uh, Saman, and I promised Taya I'd let her get a question in wherever she is. I'll look for her while you're asking your question. Thanks, Roy. It was a very informative talk. And uh, in particular, what was very interesting to me your, was your classification of bottom-up up approach versus top-down, originating from hydrology versus economics. So my understanding of the field is that so most of the hydroeconomic models that are out there have originated from engineering or hydrology, what you refer to as bottom-up ap approach. But as you said, economy is very simple or simplified or naive in those kind of models. I wonder what's your take on that of the future of what we should be doing for hydroeconomics. Do you think we should bring in better economy or in general, if you have any comments on that, I appreciate that. Yeah, so um, I, I think both approaches are, uh, are, are necessary and it relates directly to the question I had in the conclusions. What, what are the, what, what 
what, what is the question that you actually want to uh, answer? Um, so um, t I, I've done actually some recent work with um, uh, Amory Telman from uh, Laval University here in, in Canada. He has a model, a bottom-up model for the Nile. We have a computable general equilibrium model for the Nile as well. We basically uh, simulate and estimate the same policy scenarios, the building of the Grand Renaissance uh, Dam in, in, in Ethiopia, what it means for the downstream countries. Um, as I mentioned, the only thing that flows in my model is, is money, no, wa not water. In order to uh, better assess the impacts on water, um, I, I work with him to uh, calculate through the, the, the policy scenarios with his model, which has a lot of hydrological detail, and that's, that's able to, uh, on a season or, se uh, or even on a, a quarterly or monthly basis, to ass assess what the water flow levels are in the different uh, riparian countries and what that means for agricultural development, etc., um, together with the macroeconomic implications that, that we assess. We miss out on that level of detail. And in the end, I think both matter. Um, you can use the macroeconomic approach to show that um, the building of the dam has beneficial effects also on downstream co countries. How it works out in more detail with water availability is only, um, uh, you can only address that issue with, with, uh, with a bottom-up uh, uh, model. Okay. I think given the time, we're going to, uh, we're going to uh, break now. Uh, for those that would like to join us at Boffins, we'll be heading there momentarily. And uh, thank Roy again for a very thorough talk. Thanks. Thank